Now, I've thought about this, and I hope this comes out right. If it doesn't, then we'll all get over it and move on. I'm not sure there is a, I'm sure there are maybe equal, but I don't know that there is a greater revelation that the child of God needs to come into on the path road to maturity. If you can understand that or not. Uh, but there is a battle in the earth and there is a battle in the souls of men and women to come to terms with the truth that God is good always. No negotiation, no uh, look, look at the end at the little fine print. God is always good. I'm going to tell you, you don't naturally come to terms with that. In fact, Bill Johnson uh, wrote in his book, uh, Face to Face with God, I never realized how controversial the subject of the nature of God could be until I began teaching week after week that God is good always. He was shocked to run into the fact that the people that he was walking with were struggling with the, the deep reality. Now, we're no, we're no longer talking head knowledge, right? Now we're talking heart belief. We're talking heart faith, right? The goodness of God. And, you know, I've thought about that. Um, and I want to begin today's sermon this way. There really are, and I'm sure there may be more and you could phrase them differently, but I think there are three primary questions. When somebody says God is good all the time, uh, there are three primary questions that come up in the mind and the soul, perhaps of the emotions of a human being. Uh, some in particular to those who don't know God, don't even, not even sure there is a God. Uh, and then one, perhaps, that comes into the mind, especially for those of us who belong to the Lord. But the first one is this. If God is good, why does he allow all of the terrible things to happen in the world? That lies. There's an undercurrent of that question going on in the souls of people. Second question is this. Why doesn't he do something to intervene? And then there's a third question that's generally unique to those who are uh, his own. And that's this question. Why does he allow bad things to happen to his own people? So those three questions, uh, they're running underneath. You know, they, they might not actually even always be operating up here on this level, but they're running under the heart level. And so I'm going to briefly touch on these. I, I mean, we could go into depth on all three of these, but it's the third one that I really want to get to today. But let me begin by addressing this one very quickly. Why does he allow all of the terrible things to happen in the world? I've, 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 I've eliminated my circles in this answer, which you will, if you're a new life, you'll understand. When I don't use circles, something's happening. I'm, redu I'm, I'm, I'm moving it down. I'm moving three slides into one is what I'm doing. But let me say it this way. Because the human race of which God said. Now I want you to think about this. The human race of which God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Of that human race, we, we fast forward into the, the New Testament in the book of Ephesians is now due to rebellion in the human heart following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now you've got to understand that Jesus himself called Satan uh, the ruler of this present world. 1 John chapter 5, we find a truth that many find very difficult and challenging. But we've got to find our answer to these things in Scripture. And, 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 and I think it's 1 John 5, 20, 21, something like that. It, it says uh, that the entire world is under the sway of the evil one. That's why Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, made a statement like this. Something to the effect of us having been delivered out of or 
He's delivering us out of this evil age. So the answer to the first question is this. God's never sugarcoated the fact. He's never hidden the fact. He's never tried to fool anybody about the fact that in the garden there was a transaction between humanity and Satan that rebelled against him and the, and the, and the authority that was intended for humans to exercise in the earth on God's behalf was usurped by the enemy. And now across the land, across the earth, you have, a hum, you have humans who are doing the bidding of the kingdom of darkness. Why does he allow all the terrible things to happen in the world? Well, the bigger question maybe is, why did we allow? That may be the more appropriate question. But let's think about the second one. Why doesn't he do something to intervene? Now, I I want to, to you believers, I want to answer that question simply uh, with a blinding flash of the obvious. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The answer to that question, why doesn't he do something to intervene? My answer to you, he has. Listen to me, he has. And when he did, uh, Jesus' first message was this. He went proclaiming the good news. He went proclaiming good news And the reason it was good news is because of the reality that the whole earth was under the sway of the evil one. He went proclaiming good news to people who were living in the age of evil. He went to say everything is now about to shift because the rule of heaven, the rule of heaven that you rebelled against, the kingdom of the heavens, has now come into the earth in a fresh, new way. It's at hand. Repent. Quit quit agreeing with your thoughts and your lifestyle and your words with this present evil age. He's simply saying, stop it. (laughs) And allow your mind, your thinking... To, to, and that's the whole call of the, the entire call of the New Testament is a call to discipleship. I'm telling you. That it's a call to discipleship. It is a call to be utterly transformed in the way we think, live, and talk and interact with others. He, what he's really looking for, what God is doing in this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. Oh, listen to me. I want to say something to you. He is looking to raise up a people in the earth that can be trusted to move in the authority of heaven once again. And listen, this time we ain't giving it up. This time we are not going to forfeit the authority. Daniel 7, 13, 14. Think about this just a minute. Daniel looking ahead. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, listen to that, all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Hey, let me say something to you today. There, As Alan's been teaching, there is a day when all that we see is going to change. But what's going to change is what is already in motion is going to come into its fullness. You've got to understand that. So you ask the question, Why does not God do something to intervene? Oh, I tell you right now, you look at the person that asked you that question and you say, oh, but let me tell you something, he has intervened. He intervened 2,000 years ago when he took on human, uh, human flesh and he became like us. He became one of us. He's done something to intervene. And he's unleashed the kingdom. And one by one, he's building a people. 
who are going to be so much like him that the day will come you can hardly distinguish the two from one another. The last question, why does he allow bad things to happen to his own people? This is the hard one. And I'm not sure anybody can ever come into the fullness of the revelation of the goodness of God or the answer to this question um, by sitting in a seminar or hearing the truth taught. I'll be honest with you, there are some truths that you come to own through the fire. There are some things that you come to own on the other side. I still don't understand that. And I don't know how this is happening in my heart, but I believe it. He's good. Now, the re- oh, this is, the, I think, the fourth Sunday. We're kind of in a sub-series of the series of the goodness of God. And, uh, and we've been talking, working our way through Romans 8, 28. Which says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. We've been working this passage. My hope when I do this, I mean this will be the fourth week that we, we spend on it. We'll finish it up next week. Is that, we, that, that, that the passage owns us and we own the passage. The truth owns us and we own the truth, right? But the, I'm, now I want, to, I want you to understand something. The main reason that I've devoted an entire month to Romans 8, 28 is to try to help you answer the question, why does he allow bad things to happen to his own people? It's really for that primary purpose. Because if you still doubt his goodness in the face of the bad and hard and difficult things, we got to keep wrestling until you get there. Amen? So we've looked at this, and we looked at to the, this is written to those who love God. I, I made the point the first week that we began to look at this, that this is not written to your unsaved neighbor. This promise is not to your unsaved neighbor. Those, the Bible very clearly says that those who are outside of Christ are currently under the wrath of God. That's not my words. That's the word of Scripture. They're currently under the wrath of God. In other words, they're living unprotected in a very dangerous world. That's what that means. Uh, so, but this promise is to us who have been born again, to those of us who belong to Him. There's a promise only to us. No other, no other type of people on the earth can take hold of this promise. Only the people of God purchased by the blood of Christ. Then we looked at according to his purpose, and, and, I, and, I, and, and for at least two, maybe three, I've, I've tried to, I've, we've got to get this. Ro, the, the next verse, this is Romans 8, 28, the next verse spells out the purpose. His purpose is that we be transformed to be like Jesus. And if you don't understand the dominant purpose from, from which God is working, you're going to live your entire life disappointed, if not mad at him. But he's after something different than the average believer. He's after utter transformation of the human character. He's after utter transformation of the human heart, as Alan said today. He's not after your comfort. He has nothing against your comfort. It's just just way, way, way down on his list of priorities. He's after your utter transformation. Would Jesus have died just so you could have more money? The precious blood that there's no no thing equal to it in the face of the earth? I don't think so. He's after transformation. And you've got to understand Romans 8, 28 in in the context of what he's after. And then we talked about for good. And I've used, for a couple of weeks, I used an illustration of a healthy parent. As a healthy parent, uh, you're saying no to a lot of things your children don't think are fair. They think they are good. I used the illustration of a jelly donut last week compared to a bowl of fruit. (laughs) You understand? 
One is good. In fact, somebody brought me a box of donuts. <laughs> Sue, where are you at, Sue? Well, sister, I ain't cutting it. I'm going to eat a whole one. And I'm going to individually wrap the rest and freeze them and have them over the next 11 weeks, once a week. Monday morning, my day off. Though I could go home today and eat the whole box. But that wouldn't be good. But we need to understand there's a difference between what human flesh thinks is good and what good looks like when your primary thing is transformation for eternity. That's what you, so what we're doing is we're looking at, we're looking at this from God's perspective. And then we began last week to talk about all things uh, uh, to work together. And, uh, and, and last week, I primarily focused on the fact that it amazes me. God really does amaze me. I mean, I'm serious. This is not like uh, Dallas Willard writes in The Divine Conspiracy. Uh, you, you know, there seems to, it's almost like it's out in the world. Maybe even some believers tend to read the Gospels and think of Jesus as some country bumpkin preacher, you know, who uh, just kind of bumped around healing people and saying really kind of off-the-wall stuff, you know. And, and, and one of the things Dallas Willard challenges the reader of the divine conspiracy is this. There has never been a smarter person who's ever lived. There's never been a more brilliant person intellectually or spiritually or relationally than Jesus the Christ. You understand? He's smart and he's good. And in my opinion, having been a believer for a long, long time now, I have become to really admire the way that he takes everything, everything, the good, the bad, the hard, the ugly, my sin. How do you take somebody's sin and figure out how to bring good out of it? He's, he's a master at this thing. But we looked at that last week. He is orchestrating magnificently in every single individual life. And then he's somehow working us all together in this thing. I tell you what, if you don't admire God, you need to get alone somewhere and begin to think just a little bit about how good he really is. As Trevor said when he did his talk, he's not just good, good. He's good at what he does. Right? Right? But today I want to focus on this all things just a little bit to a degree. We may finish it up next week. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. Now last week I spent a little bit of time talking about all things include good things. All things include good things. Now you've got to understand something about the Lord. I'll say this and, 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 and I, I, I spent some time on it last week so I'm not going to spend much time here. But I, but I want to today, because some of you weren't here last week, and, and uh, you may somehow get the idea that God only uses hard and bad things. He doesn't. He gives good gifts. And those are part of His strategy. I tell you, when I think about the goodness of God, some of the little surprises that he sent into my life at just the right moment, the moment I needed encouragement, the moment that I needed a little breakthrough, the moment that I needed something, and then out of the blue, I might have forgot, uh, I might have forgot even to keep asking for it, and, and God just shows up. Listen. He only gives good gifts, and we saw last week, that Greek word means they're, they're, they're good in their essence and, and in their effect, their impact, all right? So, so let me remind you that, listen, just Sometimes I think we just need to slow down a little bit and begin to think about the good things that are coming into our life and realize that we have a God that's at work on our behalf. Amen? But second thing, and I've, you know, I'm category, I'm bringing, I'm lumping a lot of stuff under this one label, hard things. Right? Um, 
So just realize I'm lumping some stuff under hard things. Next week we'll go into them a little bit more. Uh, but here's the thing I want to really emphasize. I touched it last week. I want to emphasize it again. God uh, gives good things, but you need to understand this. He allows hard things. There's a, there's a misconception that God's up there just like sending out all this hard and bad stuff. Listen, I, let me tell you something. There's enough hard and bad stuff going on in the earth. He doesn't need to bother adding anything to it. Do you understand? God's not up there giving bad stuff. Yeah. Oh, well, just wait just a minute. We're going to get into some of that. All right? So, but he allows it. But some people even have trouble with the fact that he allows it. So that's where I want to camp out for a little bit today. That's my primary purpose today. Uh, and we'll see how we go on time. We may get into it next week. But I, I want us to wrestle through this, this statement, the Father allows hard things. Now, let me tell you why this is important to me as a pastor, speaking to the congregation that he pastors. Um, there needs to be a group of people somewhere in the earth that really believe God's good. You understand? There needs to be a group of people somewhere uh, that knows how to handle people's questions about hard things and bad things and challenges in life, right? There needs to be a group of people who won't drop, as Robert Mern says, drop and, and minister to their shoes when their neighbor asks them about these things. And you're kind of embarrassed. And so, frankly, I'm training us to be able to answer those questions for ourselves and for others, right? So we're going to talk about uh, the Father allowing hard things. Now, uh, there are three primary ways. Remember, when I do two and three and four, listen, I know you could, you know, you could say six or eight, but I try to condense them as much as I can. The Father allows us to experience human life. Now, what do I mean by that? The fact that I was born again back in, I believe it was 1980, um, in the fall at a revival down at Stony Point Baptist, uh, the fact that I was born again, uh, I did not get a card that said, uh, you are hereby exempted from the common troubles of life as a human on earth in this evil age. I didn't get a card like that, did you? Now, many believers uh, go around snorting and mad at God because it's almost as if they... But listen... Jesus himself said, you will have suffering in this world. I mean, I'm not quite sure if you read English how that could be more clear. You will have suffering in this world. Uh, now, but, 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 so you okay, you okay. I've, I've touched on this several times over the last several months. And you know why? You know why I touch on this fairly often? Because I've read the parable of the sower. And I know the thing that bumps most people off of the faith is when trials and tribulations come their way and they don't understand it. So I want the people that I'm responsible for to understand trials and tribulations, challenges and sufferings don't mean God's not on your side and he don't love you anymore. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you anymore. It doesn't mean the truth's not, no longer true. It doesn't mean that. Uh, so Jesus made it really plain, right? But I do want to, I do want to emphasize one thing, and this um, this may be something that we could get into a little bit more depth next week, but I do want to emphasize this. So we didn't get a card that exempts us from sufferings and troubles and the things that you go to a, an average neighborhood in America, and you know, you got all this stuff that happens. So we did not get exempted from any of that stuff, nor can we predict what will come when necessarily, right? But we got something. That is extraordinary. Because let me give you a little bit more of the context of John 16. In me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I have conquered the world. So you've got to understand, um, that I, you know, I, I am a pastor speaking to born-again believers. And I'm saying to those born-again believers... Um, you're going to have trouble and suffering in this world. You're not exempted from that. Now, if I were a civic servant speaking at um, uh, a rotary club gathering of people and I brought that same message, 
you're going to have trouble in this world. My motivation might be, so let's all kind of do the community thing and gather funds. Let's be prepared to help one another. Uh, But what I couldn't say is what I can say to you who's born again. You're not exempted from the trouble, but you have access to the peace that goes beyond human comprehension. See, we're not, the natural stuff we're not, always, we're not necessarily exempt from. But we have this supernatural thing, the peace of God. Paul wrote to, to the Philippian church, the peace of God which goes beyond human comprehension. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. He also said that in, in John 14, Jesus did. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. So I, I want to say to you, yeah, I am delivering some news uh, that, that the Father allows hard things. We did not get an exemption from the common troubles of life. However, in the midst of that, we have access to something that will stupefy your unbelieving neighbor. You've got to understand the way God works in this thing. The same thing that would bring your unbelieving neighbor to an utter despair happens in your home and you don't only go into utter despair, but somehow they look upon you and you are living above this this terrible thing. Is it any wonder that one of the ways Peter uh, instructed the church to be ready to evangelize is this. Uh, Be ready for when anyone asks a reason for the hope that is within you. What are the... It's peace. But not only that, I want you to think about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy. But notice the the, the next part of the title. I love the way Paul gives God titles. And the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves have received from God. That's real. It's real. I'm not a psychologist playing mind games with you. I'm a preacher telling you about a reality from a kingdom that you cannot see with your eyes but is no less real. In fact, it's more real than what you can see with your eyes. There is a comfort. Sure, God allows, by the way, I, uh, here, I'm going to wait a minute. I want to wait. I want to move into that warning in a minute. <laughs> I need to be prepared for it. Hold on a minute. All right, now, you ready? I'm ready. So you got that last point, right? Okay. Not exempted from troubles, but man, we've got peace, comfort, hope, the things that are so supernatural. Uh, We've just got to make sure that we begin to tap into it, right, and take hold of it. Now, I'm about to transition with a warning that's so critical. Because you see, the point that I just taught is a most dangerous point to teach. What I just taught you is dangerous to teach. Unless you bring a warning. To say that the Father allows hard things is not meant to justify submitting to nearly any problem that comes along. That's an, that last part's Andrew Womack. Um, I'll probably give you the rest of that quote next week. But now, this is what we've got to understand. But the good news is we're people of the Spirit. We're navigating life by the Spirit, right? Just because trouble comes into my life, my first reaction cannot be to buckle the knee to that thing and say, well, this is just a trouble, trouble something. No. No. (laughs) No. 
That woke you up, didn't it? The Father allows us to allow hard things. And this is a point we've got to start getting. Now, I didn't say this stuff was easy. You can only navigate this by the Spirit of God. But there are hard things in the earth. But I'm telling you something. If you observe the life of Jesus, very, th- very few of those hard things stood in the end. Because we've been, he, was, he had all authority in heaven and on earth. So one of the things we must see is a lot of the things that we would easily just say, well, that's just the troubles of this life. Uh, no, the truth of the matter is it very well may be something that you've opened the door to through sin or poor choices. Or this is maybe even bigger through our own words. That's massive. That's big. Listen, we're not exempt from troubles in this earth. I'm gonna, we've already dealt with that, right? We, that we're not exempt from that. But God forbid that we use our tongue to invite things that never should be brought in or upon our lives, right? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but please, I, I pray here. And, and let me just go on with, with that a little bit. Uh, the, the, maybe it's because we do not know the ways of the kingdom, Right? Or uh, maybe it's because we do not know or move in our authority. So my first point has got to be quickly followed with a warning. And then I've got to say, every hardship, everything that comes into my life, I'm going to tell you something. We'll get into this a little more next week. But I want you to notice the thing that so many of us use as a card for laziness, uh, Paul's thorn in the flesh. We're going to get into that next week. Uh, It's like, well, you know, no, listen to me. Paul very clearly said he went before the grace, the the throne of grace three times until God said, there's no need coming back on this one, Paul. We'll talk about that next week. But the point I want to make today is he didn't just assume that this was his new plight. He didn't assume that. Why? Because everywhere you see this man walking, he is a walking Uh, um, uh, container of of kingdom authority I mean this is the guy who knew the authority that he had and he held off a couple of days before he finally got so frustrated that he spoke to that demon that was in that uh, in that soothsaying girl there in Philippi that got him in so much trouble he knew that was going to bring bring trouble he also knew he had the authority at any moment to say come out of her And it had no option but to come out. This is a man who knew his authority. And he didn't just take everything lying down. It's easy to read some of the things that he says and think that, but he didn't. So one of the things I'm wanting to encourage us is there will be troubles in this world. Yes, absolutely. But let every one of those go through the filter of I'm standing in the truth of Scripture I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray and I'm going to press in. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to go before the throne of grace. I'm not just going to say, oh, yes, have your way with me. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's so critical. But to navigate those two things, takes a, really it takes some maturity. It takes some knowing that God is good, right? So the Father allows hard things. And, the, and, and, and uh, uh, the Father allows us, part of that is the Father allows us to allow hard things. And the other part, um, oh yeah, yeah, I, I forgot I put this in. I actually moved it around. I think this is a critical statement. Have you ever noticed with Paul, if you read, he, he's, if there's one main theme he's after in his prayers, almost He wants a revelation of the will of God for the people. Why? You say, why is that? Well, a lot of it has to do with this. See, the more revelation of the will of God, the ways of God, the ways of the kingdom, the more we're going to know how to navigate what we allow and what we we don't allow. You you understand? Let me put it to you frankly. I'm not going to go into details, But there are things today in my life that I do not allow that I allowed a year ago. 
Why? Have I gotten more holy? I don't think so. I think I've just come to understand the ways of the kingdom more than I did a year ago in this area. You you understand? And so that's why, Paul, I just chose this one. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Now, I want to make a um, kind of a closing thing. Then we'll go to a, you know, Karen, you can come on up. I'm going I'm to land it early, uh, save myself some sermon preparation time next week. Glory. But let's stop for a minute and just give some praise and thanksgiving. <laughs> well, I want to say something to you, though, because, you know, I'm just going to talk to you like I was, you know, I'm talking to me. When we read something like that, rightly we think about moral things. We think about growing more sexually pure. We think about growing better in our relationships, more loving and all of that stuff. And that is very true. That's totally true. Uh, we, we want His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. But I want to make, uh, I want to make an observation. It also includes moving in the authority of, king, of the kingdom of heaven. I hope you can hear what I'm saying. God's dream is not just to have a morally pure and righteous people. His dream is not just to have a people who um, know how to get along. And when hardships come in the midst of relationships, they know how to love one another with a deep and abiding love that comes from the Spirit. That's true. He does. Yes, He does. But keep going, because he's also after a people who understand uh, the reality of the kingdom of the heavens. He's after a people who understand and can be in tune with the Spirit and can come into a hard situation and certainly a demonic situation who can understand and they can, because they know the will of the kingdom, they can say, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. Quit acting like it is. This is not acceptable. We have to stand against this. Do you understand? That's also a walk that's worthy of the Lord. It's part of the walk that's worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. Do you see that? So, Let me land with this and then give you a little glimpse into where we'll go next week. Two things I really hope to, hope, hoped to have communicated today is, yeah, the Father allows hard things, but uh, the Father allows us to experience human life, and the Father allows us to allow hard things. And that is something He doesn't necessarily like to do. But next week, we're going to go into a third one, which may be even more challenging. The Father permits the enemy to harass. But we're going into it. And when we come out of it, there ain't going to be no wimpy, whining Christians hanging around new life. You understand? Um, no, you know, that's why I love, I love what Andrew Womack speaks about that particular verse and uh, that passage in um, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 8, 9, you know. Um, you can almost fear, hear the righteous indignation. Uh, here's the point. The body of Christ has used that long enough to make excuses. It's time to go into it and hear what the Scripture actually says and come out of it with lessons, learning the ways of the kingdom, and then move forward with greater understanding and authority in our dealings with the demonic realm. Does that make sense? So we're going to get into that. And I hope, if, if, if there's time, we'll see how this works. I hope what we can do is kind of tie it all together in the midst of all of this stuff. How in the world does God even have time to bring good out of all of it? Some of it's self-obvious, but uh, um, um, 
But anyway, we'll, we'll go into that. So, I'm going to invite you to stand. You were not born again to be a victim. You were not purchased by the blood of Christ Jesus, given the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, within you and upon you to live your life as a victim. Now, if you would like to go from, let's just say religious, term, you know, glory to glory in this area. If you would like, see, we're all susceptible to a victim mentality. It's true. I have to battle it. We're all susceptible to this poor me syndrome. Or I don't understand or. So my question is not do you struggle with it. My question is this. Would you like to move forward in power and see that thing in your rearview mirror once and for all? Amen. Let's just pray. Let's ask the Lord to do that. Today, begin to work. Uh, I think he's already doing that. And then, um, uh, and then next week as we go into the word again, let's ask the Lord to do this thing. So just raise your hands. If you want to, you don't have to. Father, we come before the throne of grace this morning. And we are so grateful. We are so very, very grateful, uh, God, for the word. We're so grateful for the truth. We're so grateful for the Holy Spirit. We're so grateful, God, for your commitment to work within our lives and in our hearts. We're so grateful, Father, for your commitment to transform us to become like Jesus from glory to glory. We are grateful. And Father, we are asking for you very specifically to do a massive work in our hearts and in our minds uh, in this thing that we're addressing right now. This issue of, uh, of, of hardships, of hard things, of, of your goodness, Lord God. We are asking God that you, Lord, would do what only you can do. We are asking you that you'd use the word to pierce like that two-edged sword you promised it would be. And you would divide between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow. I ask that you would discern the thoughts and intents of our hearts. I ask that you would transform us. And I ask God that you would make us a people who with integrity can look in anybody's face and say, God is good. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite the prayer teams to come up. If you have a need today in your physical body, it could be anything. I don't even hardly start the list because you may stop it wherever I stop it. Any need that you have, um, uh, we're going to have folks who are going to be available to pray for you. Folks who believe that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and who will, who will pray with you and come into agreement with you and uh, come into agreement with your faith and, and perhaps if you're honest enough to say I don't, I'm not having much faith in this area then, then, then they'll have the chance to come in and bring a measure of their faith to boost yours up but I want to encourage you to come and receive prayer if you need prayer for anything today amen so this house going to work Karen will lead us in a song and, uh, as, as kind of a closing thing and um, when that song is over you're free to go you're free You've been free to go since you came. You know that, right? But you certainly be free to go then. Um, but you're also free to come and, and free, to, free to hang out. So God bless you.